Well, thank y'all all for coming out. Um, you know, this is this is a, a great time. It's an interesting election cycle, I think, to say the least, on all fronts. Um, so um, I think it's great y'all are here, uh, and y'all are going to have to suffer to listen to me talk about fundraising for the next couple of the next little bit. Um, who's ever contributed to a campaign? Okay. Who uh, who has who's been to one of those big rubber chicken dinners? Who's ever held fundraiser? Who has ever been on the host committee for a fundraiser? The finals. You brought ice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you fundraise. Fundraising is who are the candidates? I know we have one candidate. Where are the we have another candidate here. You're a candidate. Just the three candidates. Is that right? Good. How many of you like? Are you looking forward to fundraising? Started it yet? No. How much money is it going to take to win your race? <laughs> ballpark. I mean, what do you know, ballpark? Mm -hmm. I find that state house races fluctuate greatly in how much money they cost. And, and, and I'm not familiar with New Mexico politics at all. So I'm just curious. I've got like 4,500 square miles for my. my wow. Yeah. Who, what? 4,500 square miles. There's a population of 30,000 people, 4,500 square miles. That's winnable. That's winnable. Yeah. It, it 100% is. Yeah. That is a congressional district over there. New Mexico. What's the big city in that? Um, Carlton, I would say. Okay. Learn something every day. Yeah. Um, so, money. Money. The sordid topic of coin. Money makes the world go round. Regardless of what anybody tells you, in order to be successful, there has got to be money in your campaign. Uh, money is the mother's milk of politics. That's from the California Assembly, California Assembly man. Uh, Ward Blackwell, founder of the Leadership Institute, has another point to make, which I'm sure will make an appearance somewhere in this PowerPoint presentation, so I'm probably stepping on myself. Um, Ward has a statement that you can't change the world if you can't pay your rent. And so at the end of the day, money has got to be part of it. As much as people talk about we should take money out of politics, we should, well, you can't. The two ringer. It'd be great if we could in an ideal setting, absolutely, let's do that. However, in the real world, it just doesn't work that way. So we have to get out there and fundraise. So today we're just going to give you a, kind of a brief overview of fundraising and how fundraising works. You don't like fundraising? Do not run for office. Do not run for office. Um, without fundraising, if you can't fundraise, just get out. If you just have a moral objection to fundraising, get out. Don't do it. Don't waste your time. Don't put yourself in the embarrassment and the pain of having to go through it. Just don't do it. Fundraising is not about begging. You are not begging somebody for money. And a lot of people can't get through that. They can't put their pride aside and realize that fundraising is not begging. I'm not going to say, please give me $500. Please. I'm actually asking you to invest in me. And I think that's the important thing to do. You don't sell it as, you don't sell it as um, begging for money. This is, if you're raising money for your county party, your campaign, it's an investment. And that's the way you need to sell it to people. You know, I'm asking you to invest, to grow the party, to grow my candidacy. Um, that's what this fundraising is about, inviting people to participate in something important, make an investment, promote issues that they care about. These are the issues when you're making fundraising calls, or you're doing things for fundraising efforts. Think of these things that are how does this, How is this important to this person? How is it important? They're making an investment. And how are they getting to promote? What is it going to do? What exactly is it going to show them their money in action? So we'll talk a little bit about campaign finance laws. They fluctuate from state to state. This is a federal example because it's all encompassing. But your, your, state, your state fundraising guidelines we outlined in your state election code, it's done for parties and be done for candidates. Take them seriously. Do not, campaign finance laws are not a place you want to play fast and loose. And oh, it's kind of a gray area. No, 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 no. It either is or it isn't. Figure out your laws for your state. What can you contribute? Some states, some states, the Wild West. There's no contribution match. All you have to do is report the money. It just depends on your state. Um, for example, where I'm from in Alabama, on a state race, you can contribute up to $99.99, .99, and I don't have to put it on the report. I have to report that I've got $99.99, .99, but I don't have to say who gave it to me, and I don't have to say where it came from. It's an interesting thing. And all states have some kind of little catch all in there. So Please make sure you look into your campaign finance laws um, for your state. 
Alright. Developing your finance plan. Um, yeah. um, developing your finance plan. How much money is it going to take? How much money is it realistically going to take? And I always tell people when you're developing your finance plan, you need to start on election day and work backwards. Start with how much is the, you know, how much is the watch party going to cost me? And honestly, don't even include that in your budget, but you probably should. Start with election day. How much is election day operations going to cost and work your way back? That's the easiest way to do it. You can always, you know, you're going to build an allowance that way. Where will the money come from? Am I going to hold events? Am I going to go do personal solicitations with donors? Am I going to make fundraising phone calls? Can I take money from a PAC? Are there PACs that are going to offer me money? How can I solicit you? Am I legally offer? Can I legally solicit money from PACs? Or do I have to wait for the PAC to come to me? Um, if you're a county party, something you would need to be aware of is, do you qualify as a PAC and you have a PAC to PAC transfer money? Who can you take money from as a county party? Who can you take money from? Um, these are all things you need to be aware of. Deadlines, it goes back to your campaign election laws. Do not play fast and lose your filing deadlines. That is how you get into a lot of trouble. Um, it can go from having to pay a fine all the way up to jail time. If you miss certain, so states have very strict laws where you miss a campaign finance filing deadline, you go to jail for 30 days. Try winning an election after doing that. <laughs> um, so just be aware of that. Make sure you have the important dates. Put them on a billboard so you see on a calendar so you can see them. Even if you didn't raise money, sometimes you were still obligated to tell them, I didn't raise any money. So don't just assume because, you know, somebody can give me a thousand dollar check this month that I don't have to file the report. No, you probably still have to file the report just saying that you did not um, take it. The budget. All right, most of y'all are running on very small levels. I mean, a handful of y'all are running on bigger offices. Um, how much money is your campaign going to cost on a monthly breakdown? Operating, operating expenses, voter contact expenses, everything on a campaign costs money. Everything costs money. So you need to have that all broken down, very detailed. What are we going to do this month? What are we going to do in June? To rev up the campaign, our voter contact, or get out the vote strategy. What are we going to be doing? And how much is it going to cost you? Um, shows you how much money is needed every month. And this, doing, this, doing it this way will avoid cash flow problems. If you're anticipating money, if you're anticipating having to spend the money, you'll be able to avoid the cash flow issues. Money will be rolling in, you'll have the money in. Specific timelines, work backwards. Whenever the voting period starts, work backwards. Also, consider your opponent's timeline of expenditures. Pay attention to what they're taking and how much money are they taking. What are they spending their money Take into account all of those issues. Uh, generally, I've never worked in a state where I did not have access to my opponent's filings as well. I have my filings and I have their filings. So look into it, see where they're going, see how they're breaking things down, what they're spending money on. All right, so this gets us to this lovely pyramid, the pyramid of donors and what people are doing. Okay. Small level donors. How many of y'all have ever given $10 to just some charity you're very passionate about? All right, you're a small level donor. You care about that issue. Like it's an issue for you. You might write a check to, you know, gun owners of America. Why? Because you're just a huge second donor. So you give gun owners of America a donation. Or you might make a donation to PETA if you're an animal rights person or what have you. Um, for you to find the issue. Mid-level donors, people that write down just slightly more than they should, they like it for the social aspect of it. These are the people that you invite to your, you know, you're going to have a fundraiser at someone's home. The county party is going to open up the, uh, the office. These are the people that want to come over the social aspect of it. They like being able to see that, oh, we're not only are we politically inclined, we give money to campaigns or parties or whomever, um, we also can afford to do it. So that's their motivation there. They get a little social, they get a social aspect, they get a social, um, they get a little social pile in the back. Major donors. These are the guys that cut the big checks. They're buying access. This is what they're buying. And this is something on a candidate level, not so much on a party level, definitely on a candidate level. These big donors, they're buying access. Now, I, they're not buying your vote, that's illegal, but they're buying access to you. They know that I wrote, you know, a $5,000 check to your congressional campaign. You better answer the phone when I call them. You know, I mean, they're buying access to you. They want to be able to, they want to, be able to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with you. Um, so be aware of that when you're dealing with major. Um, all right, now, I've sat here and told you about fundraising. Now, the question always comes to, well, where do I find them? 
where do I find these people? What can I do? How many of y'all send out Christmas cards? Holiday cards, what have you? How many of y'all them? That's your first fundraising list. It's your, uh, it's your Christmas card list. Now you might want to go there and do some editing off of it, but they're the first people you want to get in touch with. They, they're people that know you, you obviously have some level of relationship with them where you feel confident and comfortable sending them a holiday card or a greeting card. That's your first list. So you're going to start with your personal social network, your Christmas card list, and then break off of that. Who are the other people you know? Your friends, your family. You need to be the first donor to your campaign. Always be the first donor to your campaign. It shows you have skin in the game. You're willing to put your own money into it. You're not just willing to spend my money, you're willing to spend your own money as well. Um, caveat to that though, are you candidates? Set a number that you are willing to put in of your own money that you can afford to put into your race of your own money. And do not go for another penny more of your own money. I have seen candidates that have gotten into very bad shape very quickly by funneling money in their own personal. They didn't want to fundraise, so they just they just finance their own campaign when they weren't wealthy enough to be able to do that on their own. Um, so be very careful. If you're going to put your own money in, talk to your wife. <laughs> make sure that uh, make sure that um, make sure that somebody is there to stop you. If they see you making a run for the kids' kids' college fund, immediately. Um, so your per personal network, house file, your current list of past donors, past campaigns, and other candidates. Talk to people that have ran before. Maybe somebody, you know, they can introduce you to their network. Fundraising is about expanding the network, finding more people that have done what you've done in the past, and building off of that. They can introduce you to people. They can say, well, so-and-so donated to my campaign, you should give them a call. These people gave to my campaign, you should give them a call. Political parties, PACs, associations, a um, little trickier subject. Um, <clears throat> if the political parties are going to make a donation, PACs are going to make an association. Make sure it's within the letter of the law. They're not giving you more than they should. Um, be careful who you take money from. That's another big one when you get to this level. If you're going to take money from a PAC or an association, be careful who you're going to take money from. Um, and know that there generally are strings attached to money that come from associations and PAC. I know because I've recently run one. Um, there, there are strings that come along with that, so just be aware. Um, you can, if you are so inclined, you can actually purchase or rent lists from professional fundraisers. Um, you can actually call them up and say, you know, I, uh, I want to raise, I need to raise ten thousand dollars, which is probably a pretty accurate budget for smaller legislative races. Um, I need to raise ten thousand dollars. How much do you sell me your list for? If you're going to go that route, you're going to hire a professional fundraiser. You're going to go this route. Check your professional fundraiser out. Anybody can claim to be a fundraiser. I mean, I can, I can right now, I can tell you I'm a fundraiser, I'm going to raise you $10,000. What you don't know is that in the contract, I'm going to take 9% commission on everything that I raise for you, and you're, you know, you're going to lose your money. So be careful. There are lots of unscrupulous people out there that will take advantage, particularly of first-time candidates. So just be aware of that. Um, they're not all bad people. In fact, most of them are good people. But um, there was a guy running for Congress in Alabama a few years ago who, um, I mean, he got taken by a fundraiser. Um, they raised him $150,000, but they took 80,000 of the commissions off the 150. So he ended up with, what, what is that? I'm terrible at that. $70,000, is that right? That's all he ended up with. That's what he ended up with at the end of the day. And then, not to mention, he had to pay their retainer on top of their commission, which was $10,000 a month. I mean, he was taken for a right. He's actually in court. He lost his house. His wife lost her restaurant. He lost his house. Um, so that's what I always tell people: be very careful when you get into this. Be very careful. Um, it's easy to get carried away, um, and it's easy to take it for a ride. So if you're going to go the route of hiring a professional fundraiser, please check them out. Just out there are a lot of them out there. There are a lot of really good ones out there, and there are a lot of really bad ones out there. So I just always recommend: please be careful. And then the other one: the registered lobbyist. I am a registered lobbyist. Um, so I'm part of the problem, I am telling um, Be careful with that too. You're taking money from a registered lobbyist, once again, be careful. Follow the laws. Are they allowed to give you money? Can they contribute to your campaign? Follow your state laws. Don't take any more than you have to. And be aware, if you go that route, once again, it comes back where there are strings attached to that money. Research. 
what does it look like when you're researching your potential donors? Well, you need to know, you know, you get the list of people. What kind of connection do you have with this person? Do you have a connection with this person at all? You know, do your kids go to the same high school? Did your kids play on the same soccer team? Figure out some kind of personal connection you might have with this person. It just makes it a little bit easier. It makes it a little less awkward. Um, you know from Texas? Oh, I've got that Aggies? Okay. I'll tell you all that. Just, I mean, I'm sorry for putting anybody, but Aggies make some of the best fundraisers out there. Because whenever an Aggie runs for office, they send a letter out to the Alumni Association, they get money poured into their campaigns. Why? Because it's a good Aggie. Support a good Aggie. You know, everybody, doesn't matter Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Communist, doesn't matter. You donate to them. Why? Because they're a good Aggie. And that's what you do. So figure out connections like that. Maybe you go to your local alumni association. Maybe you're a member of a, uh, your local alumni association. <coughs> Friends, interests, careers. Make sure you know something about this person. Best method and time to contact this person. Let's say I'm going to call some local bank president who is, who is of my same political persuasion, or who's me on the issues. He's kind of, he's along with me. I don't really know him. Maybe we, you know, maybe our kids play soccer. <coughs> when should I call a busy man like that? When should I get to him? General time of day. Evening. Who says evening? Okay. Somebody disagree with evening? First thing in the morning? Anything else? First thing in the morning is probably a bit. What the? First of the month. First of <laughs> Even better. Paying attention. That's right. Um, you call him during the day. Don't call him like oh, He's a busy man. He's a man about town. He's a God is in his office all day from 9 to 6, first in the office, last in the week. Do not call that man at home. When he is at home, that is time for him to be at home. You call him at the office. You call him during the day, and you, you try to get a time with him during the day. Why? Because he's busy. He doesn't have time. He doesn't want to deal with you after hours. You've got to be assertive. That sounds a little bit scary. Some people are like, oh, you never do that. You've got to be a little bit assertive. And the other thing about fundraising, you've got to deal with rejection. Who deals with rejection? Nobody ever. So we're all a bunch of silver lasers? <laughs> Are we? Fundraising, get used to it. You will hear no a lot. You will hear, I just can't. Um, you've got to be able to rebound from that. You've got to be able to rebound from that. Um, it hurts. You know, it, don't take it personally. Do not take fundraising personally. Somebody says, no, I just, look, I just can't. I just can't. Um, don't take it personally. They're not saying they don't believe you. They're not saying they don't like you. It's about a big time. But just get used to hearing it. But also, learn the Gwinnett. Learn the Gwinnett. Soft no is a soft no. Somebody that just says no today, they might not say no next Tuesday. Or they might not say no a week from now, or two weeks from now. So unless it's a hard no and they go up and donate to your opponent, you can go back and revisit this person. Hey, remember a couple months ago we discussed you know, my candidacy and um, I really needed you know, $250 to pay for you know, yard signs. Um, Look, you know, I, I, I know you could do 250 a couple weeks ago. Can we talk about, you know, 175, 150? Don't be afraid of it. I mean, you've got to learn to be a little bit of a, of a, of a bargain maker here. And figure out what works. Um, donations to other candidates and causes. What, who have they donated to in the past? Have they donated to libertarian candidates in the past that ran in this district? If so, that's the first person you need a phone call to. Um, this cycle, I think I'll tell you this cycle, I would look at who donated to some of the other people that have ran for president but are not currently running for president. <laughs> that'd be, this is like anything's on the table. Uh, people that used to be involved in maybe one of the other major parties and suddenly is no longer involved, maybe hit them up and see what's going on there. Um, figure out people's motivations. Figure out what works. Um, what issues will motivate this time? Okay. Edgar Wall. You might know Edgar Wall. I just know the name of it because he's kind of a little bit of a celebrity in the South East. Um, Edgar's from Alabama. He's insanely wealthy. Insane. Does not just cut your check. Will not be. You can call him Ed or Hey. I mean, this, this kind of guy can write you a twenty thousand dollar check. Not bad enough. Um, hey, Ed. You know, I need um, I need uh, I need ten thousand dollars. No, it's all right. It's all right. But if I go see Edgar and I say, Hey, Ed, this is you know, we're going to put together a sophisticated GOTV plan. I'm going to hire two staffers. Your donation of twenty thousand dollars will pay for three people's salaries and will also give you the rent on this office. He wants to be able to see. He wants to know that his money was spent on something. Figure that out. 
Um, you go back and you look at 2012, um, both, I mean, uh, one of the, one I thought was the most effective is a Senate candidate in 2014. He's a Senate candidate in, uh, I can't remember what state he was in, but um, I somehow got on his fundraising list, or his fundraising email list for some reason, solicitation emails. Um, I donated to him. Didn't know the man. Had no clue really who he was. I looked into him. I didn't just donate blindly. I actually made sure this was somebody that I was okay to donate him to. But um, his, his um, solicitation emails, how many of y'all get those? About a million a day, right? I get them constantly from everybody. I don't know why. Um, this guy, though, it was brilliant the way he did his fundraising. Instead of just saying, I need $250 to continue to fight, you know, the liberal crazy special interest. He didn't say that. That, that means nothing to me. That's that jargon, mumbo jumbo. He did a thing where it was, if you donate $25 to my campaign, it buys, you know, two volunteers pizza while they're making, while they're going door to door for me. If you donate $100, you, you, uh, you purchased, you know, uh, new leaflets for us to go door to door with. If you made, if you donate $250, it broke down like late and everything cost. And I thought that was really effective. It worked for me. I was like, yeah, yeah, you can $25. Uh, um, make it about something. You know, it's not just, I need your money to go fight the, the, the crazies. No, that does nothing for me. Let me know what my money is going to be spent on. I'm buying something. You know, I'm buying yard signs, pump cars. I'm paying the rent or the electric bill or something at the, at the headquarters. Let me know that I'm buying something. That, that motivates a lot more people. All the data that you can possibly acquire, whatever you can find out about your numbers, you need to know. Whatever you can find, the more information I know about you, I said this this morning, and it's true in every facet of politics, the more I know about you, the more likely I am to figure out what I need to say to you to get what I want out of you. So whatever you can find out about your members, or your potential members, what do you know about them? What are they like? What are they going to turn to? What kind of car they going to um, Market research has actually come a very long way in the last couple of years. Anybody have one of those, um, who shot some Costco? Sam's. Costco. Okay. Do y'all know that when you check out at Costco, what you're actually doing, you are filling in data, it's data mining, is all they're doing. And they're going to go back and look at your Costco membership and what you purchased, and they're going to run them all together and figure out a big profile about you, and that way they can market things too. For example, um, just some interesting things from the last, the last big market research survey that came out. Um, conservatives tend to drink dark liquor. Uh, at a very high rate, and beef, eat pork and beef, uh, smoke cigarettes. Uh, I mean, it, some of them are just insane. Liberals tend to eat more seafood. They drink clear liquors and wines um, at a high rate. Uh, they they uh, vapor. Too much into that e-vaping stuff, stuff like that. Uh, the more to be more into that. It's really interesting stuff you can find out, but it's all about finding out all this information I can about you so you do what I want you to do. You come back to my store and you buy this product. I know that you, you know, you drive a Prius and so I need to market like green healthy things to you. You're probably more concerned about the environment. So I'm gonna market things like that too. Mm -hmm. um, it works for fundraising as well. The more I know about you, the more, the less awkward the transaction will feel and the more likely I am to say the right thing to you that you do. Um, you should be able to answer these five questions when you're getting ready to go. Who should make the pitch? Sometimes you as the candidate are not the right person to make the pitch. Sometimes it's necessary to use an intermediary. Maybe there's somebody that has a, a better relationship with this person than you do. Who's the right person to make the pitch? When should you make the pitch? We just talked about that with the, with the big bank president called here today. Figure out times that works for people. When should you do this? What time? What day of the week? When? You already talked about it. Around payday is a good idea. Um, what should the pitch be? How are you going to sell this person? How to deliver the pitch? And the most important one is how much money to ask for. Okay? Um, you always ask high. Which, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh gosh, no, no, no. You ask high. If I'm going to go see a donor that I know is probably good for about $1,500, I'm going to start at 3000 I really need you to do three. Could you do three for me? What happens? He says no. This is a no, but I can do one fifty or uh, fifteen hundred. I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, but hell, you never know. You might
it. I'm saying, yeah, sure, 3,000, no problem. Uh, start high. You know, if I come in and I know I need to get $1,500 out of you, and I start, will you give me $1,500? What about nothing? Cut my legs off, right? Because now I'm not even going to get what I really wanted out of it. So start high. Start high. Um, be prepared to negotiate. Um, you ask for a specific number. I need $3,000. Anybody ever went to buy a car? I know the old rule about buying a car. When you're negotiating the price of the car. I know about this. You go and you negotiate the price of a new car, you tell them what you're going to pay, and they shut up. Don't say anything else. Same thing goes for fundraising. Ask for a specific amount of money, $3,000. It's awkward, right? <laughs> he who speaks first loses. If I come back, if I say I need $3,000, and there's just that awkward silence, and then I go, well, what have I just done? I have now given him the opportunity to come back and cut me off. It's awkward. It's tense. It's crazy. But it works. He who speaks first loses. So once you get in there and you're sitting down with these people, you say, I need $3,000. It's awkward, it's crazy, it drives everyone insane. I break out in a cold sweat. But um, if you speak first, you're more likely, if you speak first, you're gonna lose. Make them answer. Um, fundraising methods, personal solicitation. That's me going to sit down with you one-on-one. -on -one. I'm gonna go sit down with you, we're gonna meet at Starbucks, we're gonna have a cup of coffee, and I'm gonna talk to you about donating money to my campaign. That is used at high-level donors. If you're going to ask for a lot of money, or this is a well-known person, or someone who has an ego, you want to do it this way. It is the one that the most politicians, fundraisers hate the most because it's awkward. Um, whenever I send a candidate in to meet with somebody, I would go a little thoughtful on this person. This is who this person is. This is how much money we need to ask for. Start with this number. We'll take this. Um, little brief bio. Kid goes to your, you know, y'all are in the same study school class. Y'all both graduated. Ole Miss. Y'all both did this. Something you can talk to them about. Uh, finance committees. Anybody ever serve on a finance committee? Finance committee is a group of people that get together to help raise money. I mean, you can kind of use the term bundler. You might familiar with the term bundler. It's kind of got to be a very popular phrase in the last couple of presidential elections is you're a bundler. I know so many bundlers. That people claim it anyway. Um, there are people that get together that they might not be personally donating money to your campaign, but through their networks, they're going to raise you X amount of money. They're going to raise you, you know, you have five people on your finance committee, you tell each one of you responsible for raising $2,000 each. That's $10,000. It's a fundraiser. Event fundraiser. This is the big rubber chicken dinner. Have you ever been to them? Been to them? Mm -hmm. They have one here in my neck. They will. I think I'll start, hey, you want, you want to know what's on the menu? I'll tell you what's on the menu right now. It is. <laughs> First, you're going to walk in the field and build this out. And it might be an orange, made or an orange on there, because we're in Florida, they might throw an orange on there just to make it fancy. And um, then there'll be vats of uh, dressing. There will be a balsamic vinaigrette type thing, a ranch. Um, I'd go with the non-dairy. Um, desserts will also be there. I always choose my seat based on the dessert that will be present. And then there's gonna be chicken, grilled, probably, and then seasonal vegetables. <laughs> where in the hell is the part of the world where broccoli, carrots, and cauliflower are always in season wherever you go? <laughs> You ever notice that? Seasonal vegetables, it's always the same thing. Like, where, what part of the world is that? Because <laughs> um, I don't want to go there. Um, so a bit butter, big rubber chicken dinner. They're great, they're wonderful. Your profit margin, slight on those. Very slight. You do not make money on those. Do not do that. Do not do that. Um, now, I do think of the county party, y'all could probably get away with a little bit more, but I've got some ideas on that. Um, but okay, so we're going to spend a couple minutes talking about events. Because um, it's, it's my favorite way to raise money. It's social, you know, it's, it's a little more fun, it's a little more laid back. Um, get a glass of wine in some people, and their checkbooks get loose. Um, um, but event fundraising. Get creative with event fundraising. It should be fun. Um, I was just in San Diego. Uh, Robert and I did a class in San Diego two weeks ago. Now, I would, not, I would never do what I'm about to tell you in Alabama. And you might not be able to do it where you, where you live either. Uh, we went to a fundraiser, guys running for um, city council in Vista, California. Uh, really nice guy, really great guy. Um, he 
did a small event fundraiser at his house. And he did a poker party. And you paid 60 bucks to get in, you got chips, and you got to sit there and play poker all night. Um, I would never do that in Alabama. One, because it's the Bible, well, the Bible built. And um, gameplay is technically illegal in the state of Alabama. Um, but think outside the box. Like, I thought that was brilliant. Like, I mean, really, and it was great. And the overhead, nothing. He hosted in his own home. Um, he had a local Mexican restaurant. They just did like tortillas, real chicken, grilled steak. I mean, the overhead was nothing. And then he had, um, I mean, they went to Costco and bought like a case of Bud Light, or two cases of Bud Light, two cases of Coors Light, a case of water, and banged around the water. Um, so think outside the box. You know, these events should be fun. They don't have to be the big, formal, stuffy rubber chicken dinner. Um, some other good ones I've been to. This one was a really fun one. Um, Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama uh, actually ripped this off from his campaign. Um, he does Sundays on Sunday with Jeff. And what they do is they go to like a local park in whatever city they're going to be campaigning in that Sunday after church. They go to Costco or Sam's or whatever. And they get those gigantic tubs of ice cream, and then they get like chocolate syrup and caramel syrup, all the fixings for a Sunday. And they set up a make your own Sunday bar at this you know public park or whatever. Yeah. And you pay five dollars to get in or ten dollars to get in, and you get to make your own Sunday. I think it's brilliant. And it, it's, and it works. I'll tell you what, and it works so great because I just told y'all not to test the rubber chicken dip. I'm angry at the rubber chicken dip. How can I be mad at myself if I made my own Sunday? Like, who am I going to be mad at? Yeah. Um, so, think outside the box a little bit. You know, things like that, I think those are great for, like, small kids. Because it does a couple of different things. When you raise some money, you might not raise a lot. But the overhead's the cheap. I mean, what's a cup of ice cream? It's a chocolate You know? Um, and you go to a public party, it costs you. Um, makes you come from A lot of groups in New Mexico do chocolate. Yeah, absolutely. Stuff they like do what? Shop and shoot? Where they just go, oh, don't cool. shoot like. Yeah. Um, Get that second amendment, right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, you know, think outside the box. I mean, you know, these are supposed to be fun. I think, I think the Sunday idea is a great thing for the party to do. Um, but it also, it serves two purposes. When you're going to raise one, you also, if you're in a part of your district where you don't really know anybody, it's a great way to be a It's a great way to get out there and be a it's about growing the party, growing your, growing your local party, growing your candidacy. That's great way to do it. I mean, who's not happy around ice cream? You're not happy around, I don't want to know you if you're not happy around ice cream. I don't want to know you. Um, so think outside the box. Barbecues. You know, so we take our barbecue very seriously where I'm from. Um, barbecues, um, crawfish boils, shrimp bowls, crab banks, clam banks, whatever. Yeah. Think outside the box. There are tons of cheap things you can do. Keep your overhead to a minimum. And it's all profit. Just think outside the box. Um, uh, online fundraising. Um, Ron Paul made online fundraising a thing. Nobody was doing this until 2008 with the, with the Ron Paul money bombs and things like that. Nobody had ever done that before. It's huge. Um, if done correctly, you can make a lot of money very, very, very quickly. Um, once again, just make sure you follow all the laws. There are tons of there. Are, there are several vendors that you can use that will be online fundraising that you can just pay out. As long as you have it set up correctly, you can just have a PayPal account set up and let people wire money into your account. Um, but just make sure you follow your laws. I always have set up lawyer in me. I was going to say, all oh, follow your local laws. You were told that PayPal, you can't put in additional information. Maybe it's just Texas for the for the requirement that we have to use like Pyrex or some of the other. It would, it would definitely depend on I mean, we we use. I have done it for state races at home, and I've done it in Alabama, Mississippi. Do you guys have to do name, address, uh, employer? Um, no. We have to do all that. Not in Alabama, not in Mississippi. I'm trying to remember North Carolina, but the, the, the rule was in North Carolina. Pirates so allows that. It, regardless, there, there are vendors out there that you can use that are, it's very similar to PayPal. It's easy. It costs you next to nothing. You pay per transaction pay, I'm assuming, or do you spend a flat rate every month? Good. I mean, it, it, it's not. I mean, the thing is, it's, it's not expensive. It's not expensive at all. Other organizations. Build a coalition. Build a coalition. You know, this, this election cycle, I mean, honestly, we should dub the 2016 presidential election as the year of coalition building. Because you want to talk about coalitions that are being built right now, it's ridiculous. I mean, they're disillusioned Republicans, they're disillusioned Democrats, they're disillusioned, I mean, there's the libertarians. I mean, obviously, um, you know, this is, this is the year of coalition building. So think outside the box, even on fundraising. 
You know, the American Independent Party. You know, they're not, they don't have a candidate. Maybe they have a donor of people that don't want some money to us. Or maybe we can get together and do this. Think outside the box about that too. Once again, a lawyer in me. Um, make sure you're following all applicable laws that have to be done with that because it gets sticky sometimes when you start talking about two packs getting together or two things getting together. If there's a pack to pack transfer ban, it gets really complicated. So um, just make sure you're following your laws. Personal solicitation, major donors require access to the candidate, phone calls to solicit potential donors in short periods of time. Meet wherever the donor wants to be. The donor, you call this guy, you say, hey, you know, I want to sit down and talk to you, and what can I come to my office? That's not an invitation for you to go, eh, I don't want to come to your office. Why don't we meet his office? Uh -uh. You go where he wants to go. You go where he wants to go. Um, call him ahead of time, make sure you set up the time. Um, candidates, right now, you all need to go home when you get home and make a list of how much time you're gonna spend every day making fundraising phone calls or developing your fundraising plan. You've got to actually do it though. It's one thing for me to tell you, go home, block off the time to make your fundraising calls. If you're not actually doing it, it's, it's, you're getting nothing done. So you've gotta make sure you're actually doing that. Um, making the act, the candidate, leader of the organization, you know, that's the best idea. Sometimes you can use a mutual friend we discussed. Um, there it is, ask for a specific amount, follow it with that. Once I've asked you for the money, I'm just going to go deadpan. Nothing. No emotion. Stone cold. Let's just have to keep thinking in your mind over and over again after you do it. Stone cold, stone cold, stone cold. Um, ask how. What to expect when you're fundraising, even if you're at an event or you're doing a personal solicitation. These are the questions you will have to answer or be prepared to answer. What's your message? What are you running for? Why are you running what, what is it about you that makes you better than candidate X out of the plot? Why is the Libertarian Party, why should I donate to y'all instead of the Republicans or Democrats or whoever? Why should I donate to you? What's your message? What do you stand for? Um, how are you going to win? What is victory for you? We were talking about this a little while ago. What is victory for you? Is victory winning? I mean, is it, is it walking into the uh, state capitol as a member or walking into D.C. as a member of Congress? Is that victory? Or is victory just scaring the hell out of the other guy? Or is victory, or is victory, you know, being the first libertarian candidate to bring ten percent in a local election or, or, or a congressional race? I mean, what's victory for you? It's not always winning. Sometimes it is. Some victory comes in different phases. But how are you going to win? How much money have you raised so far? People, you know, people say you're not really raising money. They're not going to be crazy if you write you a check. So you need to be able to raise some money. What will your projects cost? How do you intend to raise that money? Who else is helping you? Now, once again, be careful how you answer this one because some states have non-disclosure things, right? I can't tell you. You can go pull my report, but I can't tell you. Oh, John got me a check. I can't tell you that. It's on my report. It's public record. You can get it, but I can't personally tell you that. The silly, silly, silly rule not many of these states have it, but it does exist. Um, typical donor responses. The donor closes the deal. I want to help. This is the ideal one. This is the one you want. I want to help. How much money do you need from me? And they pull out their fat check book and they're ready to go. Almost never happens. <laughs> Almost never happens. Um, uncertainty. Uncertainty. Identify and answer the question. Uh, you know, Ryan, I just, I'm not sure. Okay. What, what can I answer for? You know, what, what, and if I've done my homework, I know that this guy is, I should pivot back to one of his issues. Like, look, you know, um, I know you're an avid sportsman, and you know, you're, you're a big second member, like, pivot back to that. Identify the question, identify the problem. What is the problem? Um, and see what you can do about it. And close the discussion without an answer. I'll think it over. That's a nice way of saying that. <laughs> but that does not mean you completely leave this person alone. I mean, this is just one that we come back to later. We send a thank you note. It is a lost art. Uh, the handwritten thank you note is a lost art. My mother, I have been writing thank you notes since I was like old and trouble right. My mother's always made me sit down and write handwritten thank you notes. A handwritten thank you note, regardless of how it goes, yes, no, maybe, follow up with a handwritten thank you note immediately. Um, maintain the relationship with this person. Um, just because they didn't contribute today doesn't mean they won't contribute next week. Um, really awkward conversation I had once was a, was a major donor who was backing um, one of our opponents. And I went to him and said, look, we're going to be 
you're not gonna win. You're not gonna win. Well, we but because we had not just like frozen this guy out and done as soon as our guy, he lost the primary, we won the primary, he rolls around and starts donating to us. Like he, we rolled him in. Keep the relationship alive. Don't burn any bridges. Just because that's what I was saying earlier about not taking it personal. Do not take it personal. Because you will need to go back and see this person again. You will eventually need to see this person again. Don't burn the bridge. Um, ask your donors to help you find other donors. Money likes money. People that have big checkbooks know lots of other people that also have big checkbooks. Money likes money. So get your donor, hey, you know, that's great. Thank you for your contribution of $1,000. By the way, could you maybe, you know, put us in touch with three of your friends that might be equally as generous as you? Then also use that to your advantage. You go see their friend, their friend gets you a $2,000 check. Then what do you do? You call that old guy back and say, thank you so much for introducing me to that guy. You know, he was so generous. $2,000, he doubled up on your, on your donation. Nine times out of 10, they're gonna match it. <laughs> um, but as the donor of the donors, and thank you, Thank you, thank you, thank you. You have to do finance committees. We talked about this, we'll breeze through really quickly. Um, these numbers are gigantic. Um, bundlers, bundler, bundlers, we're trying to raise, we're trying to raise X amount of money. Each bundler has to come up with a certain amount of money to help committee raises them. You know, we're gonna raise $10,000 with five people. You all need to go out and raise $2,000 each from your personal network, $2,000 each. And that's essentially how they work. Uh, wealth. Ability to make mid to large, kind of, um, this is kind of people you want to look for. Rich people, to be honest, rich people. Um, reputable titles and positions, doctors, bank presidents, maybe a minister if they'll do it. You know, people that their names jump out. You know who these people are in the communities. Um, events, uh, large events, don't do them. I'm just going to tell you that, just don't do them. You're not going to make any money. Um, the margin of error of those things is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, but if you ever do, you'll get to see the slide and you can read it yourself. Um, keep in mind when conducting event fundraising, uh, fundraising invitations need to be followed up with phone calls. If you're doing a small event, you're going to send out the invitation, follow up with that person. Hey, we're really looking forward to seeing you next Tuesday night. Um, recognize and reward your host, your sponsor, your ticket people, people that are working for you. Um, feel free to negotiate with venues. I prefer free venues, personally. Um, and I'll tell you how I did this, how, how I, I recommend doing this. In every town across America, and probably the world, there is that one house in the neighborhood that everybody wants to go. Nobody has ever been inside this house, and they all want to go into that house, right? Some of you might live in that house, who knows? Uh, that is the best person to host your party. Um, Birmingham, we did a fundraiser with Sarah Evans. We have any country music fans in here? Sarah Evans, she's a country singer. Um, she's married to an Alabama old Alabama football player now. But she's a country singer. She lives in Mountain Brook, Alabama. We got them to host a fundraiser for us. Why? Because it was some country music singer's house. Everybody and their mother showed up. And we charged, we upped the ticket price. Like we were originally asking like $100 at the door. And we saw like the amazing number of people that were coming, we upped the ticket price. To a VIP ticket, you could pay $200 if you got to come in for like half an hour before the super up tracks. Why? Because everybody wants to go into that person's house and look, right? <laughs> I'm not making this up. I mean, <laughs> everybody does this. You're all guilty. You're all guilty. Um, maybe you live in that house. Open it up. Free venues are the way to go if you could do it. I like public parks. Um, check with your city. Make sure you follow all ordinances, things like that. Um, I like. Oh, I think parks are a great way to go. They're outside. They're fun. It's it's you know it's not this stuffy bowl. You know, right? Avoid country clubs. Um, I always tell people to avoid your country club if you can. It just it gives your opponent something to run against you on. You know, you're another country club, conservative, yada, yada, yada. Avoid country clubs. Um, your house. Clean up your house. Put on a fresh coat of paint. Have fun at your house. Keep your prices on the venue below. Um, keep track of all the attendees. Thank attendees with signs and personal notes. Once again, going back to the handwritten notes. Ticket prices must cover the cost. These are just some examples of some really good um, direct mail fundraising. None of you are going to do it. Once again, you can see these powerful presentations. Um, direct mail fundraising, um, it's great. Large scale campaigns, it's, it, it tends to work. Small scale, don't waste your time. It's not worth it. You'll waste money on postage and get very um, Online fundraising, email solicitations and targeted advertising. It's a great way to go. You all get those emails 10 times a day. The trick is you've got to figure out a way to make your stand out versus the other 1,500 that are in my email. You know, I have 17,000 red emails on my phone as I'm And you know how much you're going 
good at looking at them. They're all like online fundraising emails. It's all like, don't get to me, don't get to me. I have opted out of every single one of those. 17,000. I am lazy without that many emails. Um, constant process, list building, purchase rent less, revenue shares, online petition drops. You know those petitions that's like, send, send Congress a message, sign up today. This, that is not in any way a petition. That is somebody building their list. That is somebody just continuing to get new email addresses and things like that. And it works great for a county for me. You know, sign, sign up today, get support, you know. We love puppies. Everybody loves puppies. Show your support, we love puppies. And now you've got names, email addresses, and stuff. Whatever it is. Um, online petitions are a great way to do it. And the people that are getting your emails, why not throw them a bone every once in a while and try to hit them up for a small level donation, $10, $15. You're, not, you're never going to get that donor that comes in with like $3,000 on an online thing. It just doesn't really happen in real life. Handful of cases, not really real life. Uh, here's some examples of some emails that have gone out that are pretty good. Um, actually, one is. This is what was actually sent, and this is what a bunch of professional fundraisers thought would be a better way to phrase this. You want to be positive and upbeat in this, turn a negative into a positive in your fundraising emails. Um, and so that's what happened there. Um, other projects, um, you're running for the state legislature, um, go ahead and look into the national PACs. The national PACs have state and regional PACs. Go ahead and be prepared to take money from them. Be careful about taking money. Find out your laws and can you solicit, you know, can I just get on the phone and call up, you know, the I don't know, New Mexico Real Teachers Association? Can I just pick up the phone and call and ask to see if they're a government relations person and solicit a donation? Some states you can, some states you can. Um, but it is a good idea to do it, to at least get your name out there. Um, look at the history of their donations. Do they tend to go with an incumbent? Do they tend to go with a challenger? Um, are you in a primary situation? Are you in a general election type situation? Um, all those will play into heavily with um, all those play heavily into I'll tell you, on the state level, just from experience, rarely is an incumbent going to get money, or rarely is a challenger going to get money out of, a, out of an association on the state level. Rarely. They're going to bet on the incumbent every single time. Nine times out of ten, they're going to bet on the incumbent. So it's a good idea to call them. I do recommend calling them and reaching out. But at the end of the day, rarely, with state PAC money, rarely do you find an example where they're going to bet on a challenger over here. It happens. It happens. Depends on the incumbent, I guess. Um, but just, I say all that to say, don't waste your time making a lot of those phone calls. And don't hinge. Don't let your fundraising plan hinge on that money. Um, final thoughts. Uh, money raised early is more valuable than money raised late. Um, and that just kind of goes to the money raised early. People are buying into the campaign. It builds momentum. It shows momentum is coming in. It satisfies many, many things across the board. Um, the most common reason people do not donate to political candidates or parties are this they were never asked. And I think we should kind of rephrase that. Not only was this person never asked, they were never asked correctly. Nobody ever figured out what makes Ryan Adams cut a check to the to the Kenton County Libertarian Party. What do I need? What does Ryan Adams need to hear if you're going to cut a check? Not that I wasn't asked. You just didn't ask me wrong. You didn't ask it correctly. You didn't ask it in a way that was appealing to me. And remember, in the final note, ask for a specific amount. And then what happens? Any questions? Is, is this offered in, in any form that we can go up to? You signed, did you sign one of these earlier in the, in the other? I'm about to do that. Right. You signed it the other one also, Ricky. Oh, you'll, you'll get access to all of them. Oh, okay. yeah, so you're taking care of it. Anybody not sign this that would like them? How soon do you think we would get those? Uh, if I had to, well, Robert. Robert would be down here for the rest of the weekend. I worked at a lot. My turnaround was about two to three days once I got back into the office. I, I have no idea what the workflow is like right now at the office, so I, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Shouldn't take it longer than a week. If it takes longer than a week, call. We're, 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 we're here. Yes, sir. Could you talk a little bit more about direct mail versus email solicitation? So sure, we, I mean, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, all right, so direct mail, typically the way direct mail fundraising works, I'm just checking the time. Oh, we have time. What time is this going to This gets out right now. Oh, we're done? 
Um, what, a, what a great question. Yeah, I'm not trying to dodge your question. I want to make sure I'm Yeah, and, and just to help make it a little quicker, obviously, I'm not trying to like justify direct mail because I agree with what you said were the challenges and limitations of it. But in many ways, email functions the same way, but being more targeted. You know, if we're dealing with lists that oh. we know, and you're saying, is, is, and you put it on, you know, internet as in there's there's more value, I assume, to email than direct mail at this point, right? I would think so. I would think so. Um, all right, for direct mail, um, we've all gotten them. We all get those direct mail, the letters. They're like 10 pages long, and they're italicized. They're this, one, they're expensive to put together. Just by itself, it's expensive. Printing, postage, all this, it's expensive. The other thing about that is, Unless you have got an amazing house file, or you are working with a, or you are working with a really, really, really great vendor that has got a house file, it's spec mail. You might be sending it out. You might be sending out letters asking people for, you know, a five hundred dollar donation. That would, in all theory, if you had done your homework a little bit more, might be a letter like two thousand dollars. Um, the house, unless you work with a great vendor, and that's expensive. Most people don't read them. Most people don't read them. I have no way to track. Who read and who didn't read? Um, I'm not a fan of still direct mail fundraising as a whole. Um, it's spec mail. It's okay. You're speculating for money. You're essentially hoping to get something out of it. Email, email fundraising. I prefer of the two. One, I can track. I know I can tailor make a message to this group of people. And nine times out of ten, if I'm working with a large enough organization, I've been doing the homework. I know what these people's motivations are. They signed up on one of my petitions, or I got their list through a website, or I got theirs from another organization. So I can kind of tailor make my message a little bit. And the other great thing about that is I can track who opens the page. What am I wasting my time? Um, I can track who gets the email, who opens the email, who clicks through the email, how much money do I actually get out of it. I'm able to track, and that in and of itself is a valuable thing. Somebody that actually opens the email but doesn't donate this time, okay. Why did that person donate? What, what do we need to do? What can we change next time around? Snail mail, I don't have no way of doing that. You, you have no way, right? Um, one of the best examples that I've ever seen of direct mail fundraising at work, um, 2008-ish, um, a registered piece of mail was sent out here in Florida at the Phillips. Do I know what the villages are? Just up the road, America's friendliest hometown, the largest retirement community in the world, the villages. They don't watch their commercials. It's my dreams to move there. Uh, uh, a piece of registered mail was sent to those people, and they had to go to the post office to pick it up. They set up a camera across the street from the main post office in the villages. Before it even opened, everybody was, all these little ladies and the little men were lined up around the block. Why? Because that was the highlight of their day. Was going to go down to the post office and pick up this piece of registered mail. That, that's important, right? Registered mail is important. They made so much money off of it. It was not even funny. Like, if registered mail is expensive to spend, they made so much money because all these little people thought that registered mail is important. It's important. And then they send this letter, it's like, we're in dire need of money. We need you. Everyone had donated you. $10 to $15. They made 200% what it cost they made. So they cleared triple. I mean, essentially what they cost to pay. Direct mail is fun. It's dying. Everything is moving much more towards electronic fundraising. Yes. So about the email, though, uh, looking forward to ways it's, it's more useful. Uh, I think for our, a lot of people, it's like, how do we get lists? Who are yes. we talking to? Like, can you get into some of the nuts and bolts of how you'd recommend approaching that? List building. How would I recommend list building, essentially? Which is a whole other lecture. Of or itself. buying or borrowing. Right. Um, I will say this about this. I, an email list in a campaign setting, an email list is only as good as you continue to work it. Um, Candidates, campaigns, parties, they want, they are very, very, very protective of their list. Why? Because to get a good one, you have to work it constantly. People change email addresses. Email addresses drop off, bounce back, clean it up. Um, I get really nervous when people start talking about buying and renting lists. It makes me very, very nervous. Um, I want to know who, the, who, are, who are we renting from, who are we buying from, what's their reputation, what's their grade. I want to see some of their analytics before I agree to spend any money. Because I can say, tell you, yeah, I got, I got 30,000 email addresses. 30,000 euros, that's all to do. Maybe a third of more. I mean, and I've seen it happen to people. They'll spend astronomical amounts of money to do it. It doesn't work. So they're out there and they exist. And I mean, there are really, really good ones. And there are really, really bad ones. Uh, yes? I'd like to just throw that out to everybody. We're from the state of Texas. And we approached our elderly Texas. 
and they had a database of every person who participated on one level, their name, address, phone number, sure. email. So I requested ours for Travis County and also for the 25th Congressional District. But a great place to start would be with your state party and whatever county or district you represent. They're free, they'll give them to you. It's, yes, it has to be work. It's old, but it's free and it's a place to start. You're not going to go buy 100,000 names for $100,000, but you can get a, you know 50,000 names for free. Start small. You know, I, I, typically, if, I, if you drop people back to your website, and this is typically the way you're going to build your list of small ones when you're building. You need to drop people back to your website, your Facebook page, and they need to opt in right there for it. That's the best way to do it. Um, list building, I mean, there are people that, that that's all they do, all day long. I mean, they, they, they make a lot of money as they build incredible lists, and then they sell them, and then they sell them. And um, the ones that are good, very, very good. And then, like I said, I, the guy who bought, who spent $10,000 on 30,000 email addresses, which was a bargain, a third of more, 20,000 of them you just throw out, they were ineffective, made up email addresses. Um, it, to be done correctly, and the only way that, the only way that I suggest doing it is, if you can find a regular person to buy or rent or lease from, and there are lots of there are lots of good ones, um, it has to be done organically, and it is it's tedious and it's time consuming and it's hard. Um, but it's stuff that you do, like right now. There's so many things you could do: digital advertising, driving people back to a website, driving people somewhere they can opt in. Um, now's a good time to do it in the presidential campaign. But this is great stuff to do during the off season when you're not actively engaged in a campaign. List building is, is list building and voter registration are like number one and two things people should be doing when you're not actively campaigning. I hope that kind of answered your question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. A real novice question. Yeah, I understand buying and selling, but I don't understand renting or leasing a list. If I rent it from you, what are we all doing? What is that? You're paying yeah, someone to pay. send through a third party, so you're not getting the I list. Don't get it. You're not literally you're not literally renting it. You send them the message. They send it to the list. Uh, I don't actually put my hands. If I buy, it, I get my hands on it. Uh, if I rent, I just. Yeah. It's like a one time or two time. You're paying how many I times? I, I got it. Any other questions? Well, I hope y'all enjoyed fundraising. I enjoyed having all y'all. I wish you all the best.